All right. It felt like after the last session and that, I want to get up here and go, let's get ready to rumble. <laughs> kind of fun, right? Um, but uh, there you go, right? It's all good. So everybody up and awake this afternoon. My name is Dan Weber. I'm the uh, CEO for the uh, Election Integrity Foundation, new not-for-profit to fund the Voting Village. So appreciate you all being out here today. Don't forget to uh, go and, uh, if you're on social media and that, tag it with at Voting Village DC on Twitter and use the hashtag uh, hash Voting Village DC. So happy to uh, have you guys in. This uh, next session is Bootstrapping Vulnerability Disclosure for Election Systems. We've had three distinguished folks up here on the panel. First one is Jack Cable, security researcher and student at Stanford University. Now, I think he probably have his own session going through everything he's seen at such a young age. Uh, he's a coder turned white hat hacker and a rising sophomore at Stanford. But you know, no, you need to hear a couple of these fun ones, right? So the, the coolest thing is, uh, you know, Hacker One bug bounty program identified over 350 vulnerabilities in companies including Google, Facebook, Uber, Yahoo, and the U.S. Department of Defense. And for those of you who had the opportunity to go to the Hacker One, uh, you know, what I'm saying party the other night with 1,800 people, we uh, thank them for all the uh, free drinks that we got. <laughs> it's all about dope. I'm drinking on other people's money. Katie Trimble is Section Chief, Vulnerability Management and Coordination for U.S. Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, CISA, Department of Homeland Security. Um, and, uh, you know, she, she's going to go through all the different 16 critical infrastructure sectors and levels of U.S. government organizations that she supports. And then Trevor Timmons, CIO for Colorado Secretary of State's office. Uh, he has uh, been there since 2007 after eight years as Deputy CIO and Director of Software Development. So we'll welcome all three of them and get to the heart and meat of the matter. All right, yeah, thank you to everyone for coming out today. So we're going to be talking about vulnerability disclosure for election systems. And this is in part motivated because of some work I've done um, trying to disclose vulnerabilities to various states and local governments. So I'll go into um, the stories there, my experiences, and how that could be improved. Um, but first, just to set the stage with vulnerability disclosure and why it's so important. So. It already, so yeah, in short, vulnerability disclosure is a process that allows external researchers to easily find a contact and a channel to report vulnerabilities. So if I say find a vulnerability in a company, I can email it to security at that company.com and they can easily receive the vulnerability report. And this is, it works great in industry. Um, I've, as a researcher, I've worked on programs like Facebook, Google, even the US Department of Defense. Yet among states, and especially for election systems, we have zero states or election vendors that allow reporting vulnerabilities. There is one state that has a vulnerability disclosure policy, though it is not actively maintained and they won't even respond to your emails. So we need something that allows people to report vulnerabilities and be assured that they'll get a response and that the vulnerabilities they report will be fixed. And especially for election systems, we know that this is something that is under active attack by our nation's adversaries. So if you read the Mueller report or the recent Senate Intelligence Committee report, you'll see that all 50 states have been targeted, um, especially their, um, one of the by nature public facing systems, the say voter registration databases are common targets. There have been several high profile breaches um, due to states targeting these. Even the Mueller report mentions a common attack vector, SQL injection, which was the vulnerabilities I found in in these state voting databases. So yeah, um, I'm joined here yeah, by Trevor from Colorado and by Katie from CISA. And I'll yeah, start off with some of my experiences disclosing vulnerabilities. And again, the point of talking about this is not to shame these cities and states um, for having vulnerabilities. It is completely normal to have vulnerabilities and matters much more what is done once they're reported because it's normal in industry, it's normal in government, everyone has these and we need to have channels for researchers to report them and that's not something we see anywhere with election systems, so room for improvement. 
So it all started um, with election systems for me when I was registering to vote back in October. So I was um, on my city's voter registration site and noticed that um, just putting an apostrophe in one form, I could, um, I, well, I received a 500 error, and being a curious researcher, I soon realized that this was a SQL injection vulnerability. And it's not like I was actively testing for this, but once I'd found it, it was then my responsibility to get to the right people so they could fix it. So I began the process of disclosing this vulnerability. I reached out to some contacts I had, disclosed it to several people, including the chief information officer of the respective city and tried many, many times to get to the right people. So that was in October. In December, I noticed a change. They had put a web application firewall in front of the site, which would make it harder to exploit the SQL injection vulnerability, but I could still confirm it was there. So they hadn't patched the original vulnerability, even though they had received the report. So I try again and again, didn't get to the right people somehow, or they didn't address it, and kept trying to disclose, going through alternate routes, and and May comes along, which is then six months later. So I began trying to think of other ways to disclose. I then came to Katie and her team at CISA. And then in June, I decided to just email one of the email addresses on the actual Board of Elections, just a random public contact email address. And doing that, I was able to get a response. And at least according to them, they hadn't heard anything despite all of my attempts to disclose. There are some issues, say, because the city may be siloed from the Board of Elections. But even then, you would think that if a city receives a critical vulnerability report for its Board of Elections, they would try to get the report to them. So not sure quite what happened on the back end there. But once I was able to make contact, they were able to address the report and fix the vulnerability. But that was seven months after I discovered it. So who knows what could have happened in the time between then and the time they actually fixed it. So that was in one city. Then in another state that I was um, also looking at, I realized that there was another SQL injection flaw. This was the state that I lived in, so I was also um, going to check my voter registration status and again noticed this flaw. And what was particularly concerning was this state had been breached three years prior. So if you um, it's public. If you read up, it was through SQL injection. So not only had they been breached through this type of vulnerability, but the vulnerability was still there, or at least there was a page where it was still exploitable, even though they had fixed in one area. So this was, again, incredibly concerning. I tried, um, again, going to, say, the CIO of the state, some other contacts, um, and a couple weeks later, I hadn't heard anything. Um, based on what I tried in Chicago, I also reached out to just a public contact email address for the Board of Elections, and that time got in contact with someone who was technical, and they were able to fix it within the day that they received that. And again, they hadn't heard anything despite I went to all these various people, but they never got the report to the right people. So th without a vulnerability disclosure, a policy, the process for getting vulnerability to the right people as a public individual is incredibly difficult and it will remain that way unless we give hackers, security researchers, whatever you prefer, a way to disclose vulnerabilities in a way that they can be assured, one, that they're protected and two, that it'll get to the right people and it'll be addressed. So. Yeah, that was uh, my experience is disclosing these vulnerabilities. So moving forward, what we want is for states and election vendors to start thinking about establishing vulnerability disclosure policies and giving researchers a way to help out. And by allowing a form of public contact, we can really begin to foster these relationships that we want to have, and we can start to be more constructive when it comes to security. So I really do believe that vulnerability disclosure policies are are a necessary first step towards being more transparent and better when it comes to security and that there's something that we're going to need to do and we need to do it before 2020. So with that, I'll give it to Katie who will talk through some of the work that she does at CISA. All right, so from Jack's story, you kind of can see the complexity here and all the different pieces. And so we at CISA, um, we have some vulnerability portfolios. So um, if you're familiar with MITRE CVE program, so I run that. Um, the NIST MVD program, I run that. Um, the CERT CC Carnegie Mellon program, I sponsor that. 
Um, and then the ICS cert vulnerability handlers, I sponsor that. Um, so that work all falls within my office. Um, even with all of that experience, so CERT CC has existed for 30 years. We've been coordinating vulnerabilities for 30 years. MITRE has existed for 20 years doing CVE work. We just had the 20th anniversary birthday party at Black Hat this past week. So we have a lot of experience doing vulnerability disclosure, but most of that's in products. And so even with all of that experience, we are still in uncharted territory. When, uh, when Jack finally did get to us, it still took us probably two months to find the right people for the cases that he brought to us. He had already made all of this contacts, he had already done all of these things, and then we tried to back channel in and find out the people that we needed to talk to, which just goes to show that when we're talking about vulnerability disclosure, it's not easy, it's not simple, it's not straightforward, it's very complex, there's a lot of people, and when you don't go to the right people, there's this amazing thing that has happened throughout the years, and it's these uh, this, this training we've done for social engineering, like who would have thought uh, security awareness training actually works? So so um, when we call people, you know, at big companies and we're trying to find contacts to get vulnerability information to the right kind of uh, the product safety team, we call and we say, hey, I'm Katie from Homeland Security. And they go, yeah, I'm sure you are. Click. Um, and we're like, no, but seriously, I promise I am. And they're like, uh-huh. And then they hang up the phone. Um, so it goes, it, it works. And, and so in this case, what happened is it's working negatively because people think when Jack's contacting them that, you know, oh yeah, I'm sure you found some vulnerabilities or I don't know what to do with that. Thank you for bringing it to me, but I don't know what to do with it. Um, and, and that happens. Election systems are very complex. Um, we categorize election system vulnerabilities in three ways. We look at them when we say there's one, there's one, there's software, hardware, and then there's digital services. So software is the, um, so the automated software services that allow you to vote online. Um, there's several of them. Uh, hardware, that's the individual machine that happens to be in your polling station. Usually these are air gap systems. These are solid machines, uh, industrial control systems. And then there's the digital services side. So that's your voting registrations, your databases, the web services that are available to the public. They're all vulnerable. But here's the thing about it. All of these things are vulnerable in every sector. So while we feel very unique in the election sector, I cover all the sectors. Uh, I deal with everything, nuclear power plants, Fitbits, uh, Nest thermostats, um, Pixar software, you name it, we cover it. So the challenges that are in election systems are in no way different than the challenges in any other system. It's just new and uncomfortable. Um, but there's only one way to get through that, and that's just to get through it. So we are looking at weather, or we're looking at climate, not weather. So each individual disclosure may be painful in the beginning. But once we move through that and get used to doing them and develop processes and get those things, because those processes in place, it will be so much easier. It'll be so much more straightforward. So what I have behind me is the ecosystem. And this is DHS's ecosystem. This is specifically designed for products. It's not designed for digital services. We don't normally accept digital services vulnerabilities because we're not the internet police. I know despite you know the fact that I work for Homeland Security, I am here to help. I am not a government suit. I'm sorry I'm wearing a black jacket. I normally don't. Um, but my other jacket got like a sp and I don't know. Anyway. Um, so uh, I we are here to help. We do try to help. Um, we've expanded our scope when it comes to election services because we think it's so pivotal to just daily life for everyone um, that we really need to take this and, and run with it as a, as a serious matter. So what we've done is we said, okay, we're going to also take the website vulnerabilities. We always prefer that a researcher contact the asset owner or the vendor directly in the, in the first round. But if something happens and that's a negative sort of relationship, come to us and we're, we, will, we will take that and we will try to do everything we can to get that fixed. We're all about getting stuff fixed. We believe that things should be in the public sphere. They should be the shine the light on it. The light is the best medicine. Uh, it's uncomfortable in the beginning, but we promise it'll get better. So all of that said, there's my soapbox, but let's go through the slide. Um, so when we do this, vulnerabilities are reported to us by a researcher. Uh, we can't go find vulnerabilities on our own. There's some legal liability issues that happen with that. You don't really want DHS hacking your stuff. Um, it's just not a good idea. Um, so researchers bring us vulnerabilities. We work with the researcher. We do the collection, the analysis, and the coordination. We try to independently verify that vulnerability exists. Um, that happens at CERT-CC or Idaho National Laboratories, depending on whether it's IT or OT. We then notify the vendor. We work with the vendor to develop a patch. We create a patch mitigation schedule. Usually it's 45 days. And we say at 45 days, we're gonna, we are going to disclose this. Um, once we've originated and worked on that schedule, made sure everybody's in agreement, we all hold. Uh, we reserve the CVE. We are CVE naming authorities ourselves, so we can reserve a CVE. 
Then, afterwards, uh, when we've reached our deadline and it's time to publish, we all publish at the same time. Usually it's within minutes of each other. So the, uh, the researcher publishes their advisory, the uh, vendor publishes their information with a security bulletin and usually a patch, and then we put out our technical alert or vulnerability note. At that time, the CVE is populated and made public, then it flows over into the, the NIST NVD catalog. Uh, quick between uh, NIST and MITRE. So if you, the difference there is uh, CVEs are kind of like a dictionary. They're just a, this is what it is. Uh, NVD is like the encyclopedia. It's the elaborating enriching information that describes that vulnerability. So quick difference there. Okay, so we're going to hover on this slide for a bit. So that's kind of the ecosystem as it, as it stands right now for us. Um, we're in a learning curve too. Uh, we're, we're trying to figure out how do we as a government agency adapt to the change? How do we as a government agency do better about reaching out to researchers, reaching out to vendors, building positive trust relationships? We tell people we don't hoard any vulnerabilities. Department of Homeland Security does not hold any vulnerabilities. My job is to close tickets, and I cannot close tickets if there's information that's not been disclosed. Um, I'm counted. My performance plan is directly tied to how many tickets I close. Uh, so if I want to keep my job, we publish. Um, there are a couple other programs that are in intelligence programs, we do not submit to those intelligence programs. That one is called the vulnerabilities equities process, if you're familiar with that. Any vulnerability that comes to DHS from a private researcher does not go into the VEP. I know because I run it. Um, I'm the DHS rep to the vulnerabilities equities process as well. So in the VEP charter, there is a section that says that vulnerabilities that were discovered during the course of incident response or security research, which are intended for disclosure, do not make the threshold for VEP. That is the exact verbiage because I say it so often. We do not hold vulnerabilities. We publish vulnerabilities. We work with vendors to make sure that they have the opportunity to fix things. Uh, we work with researchers to make sure that their needs are being advocated for. Uh, I always tell people I'm not on the side of the vendor and I'm not on the side of the researcher. I'm on the side of the taxpayer and I'm on the side of the system administrator who needs to fix that system. So we try to be the honest broker in the situation and we realize that's a little bit of a shift from typical I'm in a black suit and government official. Um, but we genuinely try. So I have uh, nine federal employees and three contractors and 50 consultants in seven states, and we all have that same ethos. We all want to make this a better place. So we have some takeaways here, um, things that we can do. When we look at this, there are all of these positive things um, that happen. This is an uncomfortable position to be in because it's new. It's so new. And we don't know how to handle it. But we've done things like this in the past. So I specifically look at the medical sector and we say, okay, well, the medical sector about five years ago was very, you know, hands off. They didn't want, don't touch my software. There's nothing to see here. But they actively embraced it. They said, you know what? Uh, we're going to change some laws here. We're going to make it easier for researchers to do research. Uh, we're going to accept those, those vulnerabilities and we're going to fix them. And that has made so much difference. It's now a routine thing. So much so that it's not even newsworthy anymore. Um, and, and that's where we want to go. We want to make it routine. There are so many positive things that happen when you just get things out in the light. When we try to hold things back, that's where the opportunity for negativity lives. Um, so we say, uh, Researchers, you want to talk about positives for researchers takeaways? Okay. So yeah, from the researcher side, um, just some thoughts if you're either if you found a vulnerability if, or if you want to help say your local um, government be more proactive when it comes to security. Uh, one is to offer help. So um, there's great resources out there on say volunteering with your local or state election board and really helping to improve security because the truth is is that often they're strapped for resources and some free help can go a long way. And with that, say if there's a vulnerability disclosure policy established, which we can hope to see some soon, then participate in those and give states the feedback that they need to get better. So really just to continue pushing um, the organizations to adapt those best practices out there that we've seen in other industries and we've seen how vulnerability disclosure policies can be really effective and to keep pushing organizations to adopt those and foster a type of relationship that really focuses on working together rather than say 
doing work separately. It's with the vulnerability disclosure policy, it connects the researcher and the organization so that we both can become more secure, well, the organization can become more secure. So Trevor, yeah, if you'd like to talk. Um, so uh, again, uh, you know, I work for a, a secretary of state in Colorado and a Colorado, nor our office today currently have a vulnerability disclosure policy or a program. That is something that we're changing. Uh, my eyes were really open to this. We've always had people that reach out to us and report uh, issues that they may see with our website and that sort of thing. Uh, that's the type of thing I, I, I think we, we tend to be fairly responsive to. Um, and. Uh, but we don't have that formality around that and, and really my eyes were open to this about five, six weeks ago, you know, around the protection of the researcher from, you know, prosecution, liability, anything like that. I mean, it's the type of thing that we engage with all the time when we have external vendors coming in and doing penetration tests, uh, you know, and doing that sort of thing. They're concerned about the impact of what they would do and whether you're going to kind of nail them to the wall. And so, you know, Colorado, we're, we're working with our state chief information security officer and within our office to make sure that we've got a solid policy. Uh, I give a ton of credit to Bo Woods from the Atlantic Council, to Eric Mill from the uh, Senate uh, Rules Committee Administration, uh, and to the folks at CISA uh, for actually kind of leading the way, providing some good advice in terms of how we can do this with you know companies like Bug Crowd and Hacker One and Synac to, to actually take this and move it to the next level in terms of a VDP, you know, kind of working together with, with you and you with us. And I, I want to touch just really quickly on the election vendors in terms of creating those channels. Uh, there is hope, uh, you know, with the designation of elections as critical infrastructure, they established this government coordinating council and the sector coordinating council where we're bringing the public sector, the private sector, federal, state, local resources together to actually talk through some of these issues. You know, the folks on the SCC, so again, those are the folks on the private side who are providing election systems, some voting systems, voter registration databases, election night reporting systems, all these kinds of things, systems and services. When they're providing them to states and to locals, that's their group, okay? They've been talking with the folks to the IT ISAC in terms of how those disclosure policies uh, work within that context, you know, with Fortune 10 companies that, that do this, do it well, and do it effectively to actually improve the landscape for all of us. And so there is hope. I mean, they're, they're talking with those people so we can figure out how this is going to work within the elections, uh, within the election side. So, so the last thing before we go to the resources, I just want to say, um, so I, I always put this quote up, and those of you who've seen me brief before, you've seen it before. Um, so I love this quote. It says, vulnerability sounds like truth and it feels like courage. Truth and courage aren't always comfortable, but they're never weakness. So the point is that this is uncomfortable. We get it. There, there are so many moving pieces here. It is, it is hard to admit that there are flaws, there are failures, there are, uh, there are vulnerabilities in every system. Everything has vulnerabilities in it. But the, the point is that we have to work forward. We have to, we have to move past that. The opposite of love is not hate, it's indifference. And so when we can't have a conversation because we're so caught up in the, in the politics or in the, the negativity or in that bad feedback cycle, that is the worst place to be. We need to be able to have a conversation and we need to move into that conversation from a place of understanding that it's not weakness just to talk about it. It's, it's truth and it's courage. Um, so that's, that's where we stand on it. Uh, we do have some resources that we listed here. Um, if anybody wants to talk to any of us, we're, we're happy to go outside and do it. I think there's another brief that's, uh, that's coming in. We don't want to just delay them. Um, but do you guys have any closing thoughts? Yeah, I would just say, yeah, please do come talk to me or Katie or Trevor. I really do want to help out as much as I can in, say, uh, giving advice for starting a vulnerability disclosure policy and making it as easy as possible. So, yeah, we have some resources up here. The Department of Justice has published a great vulnerability disclosure framework. There's Disclose.io, which has open source vulnerability disclosure policy terms. You can look at other vulnerability disclosure policies out there. So, yes, please do come to us and talk and see see how the process for starting a vulnerability disclosure policy isn't that hard. And by putting it out there, you can begin to get external help and begin to know what you can do better and start really improving security. So yeah, I would like to yeah, thank you and try to do better. Thank you.